Hey folks, Ray from DCRainmaker.com here. Today I've got the new Phoenix 5 Plus series. Uh, now this watch takes a lot of the features you've seen other Garmin watches add over the last couple of months. For example, with the 645, the 400 645 having music on it, uh, the Vivo Active 3 having contactless payments, uh, and then in the past, the Phoenix 5X having maps, and it brings all that stuff onto all those devices. So whether it's the Phoenix 5S Plus, the Phoenix 5 Plus, or the Phoenix 5X Plus, all three of those different size devices now have that same core feature set, including music, maps, contactless payments. In addition, the Phoenix 5X now has pulse ox, which is the pulse oximeter readings. So it has a separate LED system on it that allows you to get pulse oximeter readings from the watch itself uh, throughout the day. So that's used in hiking uh, and a lot of other different scenarios, uh, high altitude climbing, etc., to monitor your saturation levels. Now, what I'm going to do is dive into all those features individually, more kind of like an overview standpoint. Uh, and then towards the end of the video, I'll talk about some of the pros and cons in using it. Uh, by the time you watch this video, I've had it for two months, uh, though right now I'm filming this in late May here in the Alps. So I wanna give a chance to go ahead and figure out the bugs that I've seen and stuff like that and see if they're resolved by the time uh, you see this, because obviously I'm using uh, beta software right now. Uh, so I'll bunch those up at the end to kind of recap those later on in June, once I've had a chance to see where they all are uh, within the end of this video. Uh, so as I said, I've been using all three of these watches here. I've been primarily using the 5X right now, mostly because of the pulse oximeter readings, uh, but I've also got the Phoenix 5 and the 5S. Uh, and I've been using them up here in the last couple of days, hiking around. Uh, and it, it is actually really kind of impressive. Uh, and starting with that first feature is the mapping side of things. Uh, and now in the past, when I've hiked up here, uh, I don't generally tend to use the mapping side. I go ahead and I basically put in uh, the track course onto my watch and I try to follow a little breadcrumb trail. And that does kind of work. Work. But where it's been actually really interesting having legit maps on there is today. Um, so I hiked an area that uh, is still, it's late spring and it's still covered in lots of snow. Um, and with that, there are a lot of portions of the trail, my planned route, that just simply aren't viable. Uh, huge, gigantic snowfield behind you right now. Uh, and so I can't take that route. So to be able to look at the map and say, oh, here's another route, here's a trail that if I cut through this area here, I can get to that trail and keep on going, has been actually super valuable to me. And it kept me from to pull up my phone 18,000 times along this entire route up here. Uh, I think I only pulled that out to take pictures, which, which is rare. Usually I'm pulling it out all the time. Uh, so from a mapping standpoint, the way it works is all three units have 16 gigs of preloaded maps or up to 16 gigs of preloaded maps, depending on which region you're in. Uh, so if you're by the unit in North America, you got North American maps, you buy the unit in Europe, you get kind of European maps, uh, and so on. You can add additional maps to it uh, via free services that are third party, uh, or you can buy them from Garmin. That is one of the frustrating pieces that I still don't get um, why Garmin is charging especially a lot of money in some cases, hundreds of dollars for some of these maps out there. Just let me download the damn maps on my watch um, and just make it simple. Like they're open source maps to begin with. Uh, obviously they're adding additional pieces to it, which is something that's worthwhile talking about. They've added what's called trendline popularity routing to it. So that trendline popularity routing essentially takes all of the data uploaded to Garmin Connect over years and years and years across many different activities and figures out where people actually go. Similar to heat maps on Strava or other things like that, but Garmin has taken that and baked it back into the map sets. Uh, technically, it's actually a layer on top of the map sets, but either way, it's in the map set itself that you use on the device. So that means I can reroute based on that popularity data. And generally speaking, people tend to go where the trails are best. It was something Garmin introduced last summer on the uh, Edge 1030, and then we saw it introduced more recently on the Edge 520 Plus in the cycling realm. Uh, so it's really, really cool to see it here on the wearable side because uh, it is kind of handy in these sort of situations. It also allows you to do kind of this last second routing, basically just choose a point off in the distance and just simply route to that point uh, and have it choose the right maps uh, and the right route to get there. Finally, the mapping has also been useful today to me uh, in some cases on the trail where I'm not immediately clear which direction to go. Uh, and of course, when you're following a breadcrumb trail, there's a little bit of trust that you're going the right way, uh, especially because some of them aren't exactly perfect. Uh, and so there's a case earlier this morning where I was looking at a split in the road uh, and, you know, I certainly could have gone one way and waited for it to tell me it was off course and then gone the other direction. But you got to pull up uh, the actual trail and look at it and go, oh, this is clearly I can see a trail going off to the right. I can see a trail going off to the left now. Uh, this is the way I should go. Uh, and that's that's been definitely valuable to me out here. Next, we have music storage capabilities. Now, Garmin introduced that on the 4645 earlier this winter, uh, and that allowed you to store MP3 files on it and other music files, even podcasts and things like that, as well as some streaming services, in particular Deezer and iHeartRadio. And all of that carries through to the Phoenix 5 series. So that means you connect via Bluetooth smart headphones or even a Bluetooth smart speaker if you wanted to, and you can stream that music directly from your watch. Uh, now, this is not streaming from 
from the interwebs directly. You have to sync your music ahead of time using Wi-Fi in the case of the streaming services. Uh, and in the case of the MP3 files, anything you might have local, you have to go ahead and sync that um, using a cable onto the watch itself. Now, of course, the big issue people want to know about is when is Spotify going to be there? And the thing is, that really depends on Spotify. The way Garmin has designed uh, their interface for music, it's open for any platform to come into, and it's really up to the platform to do that. And we've seen Spotify kind of shy away from every single watch manufacturer out there, except for Samsung, and only that in some very limited uh, scenarios. Uh, and so that's something that, if you want Spotify, telling Garmin isn't really gonna help you. They know they want it just as bad. You need to tell Spotify that. Uh, Garmin has made some significant changes here. One of the biggest things from a GPS perspective is the introduction of Galileo satellites. So in the past, they had base GPS and GLONASS accessibility from a satellite standpoint, and now they've added Gal Galileo atop to that. That is something they introduced in the Edge 130 just about a month or two ago, uh, so it's cool to see it now on all three of the wearables. Finally, on the antenna side, one of the biggest issues with the original Phoenix 5 series uh, was the antenna design, or the, rather the communication stack to the antenna design, um, it really had problems with third-party sensors, in particular things like the stride running power meter uh, sensor and then some other cycling power meters. Garmin has said they've addressed that, um, which basically means Garmin fixed the chipset issues for that, uh, so that shouldn't be an issue going forward. In my testing with stride on the Phoenix 5 Plus series, that does seem to be solved, whereas in my testing with stride on the Phoenix 5 series, it was a complete fiasco. Next, there is contactless payments. Uh, now that introduced the ability to use an NFC payment reader, for example, at a Starbucks or a coffee shop or any other place you want on earth that has that little NFC contact payment logo uh, to go ahead and tap with your watch to pay for something. Uh, now the banks here are still somewhat limited. They're getting better sort of week by week uh, globally, but the way it works is you have to have your particular bank enrolled with Garmin. And that's actually on a bank by bank basis. So that is not like, you know, all Visa, all MasterCard, all Amex, but on a specific bank standpoint. So if like Chase Bank or HSBC Bank or ING or whatever the case may be, has to be enrolled. The use case for that is that you can go out for a run, uh, stop at Starbucks at the very end and tap in for that uh, without having to bring like extra credit cards or wallet or something like that along with you. Now, shifting back into a little bit of the hiking realm here, uh, one of the new features on all three watches is called Climb Pro. Uh, and what that does is that basically plots your climbs across a course that you have set up. Uh, so let's say I had this route coming up here and today's route was just one big ass climb, just up until I got to the top. Um, but let's say I was going up and then down a ridge line and back up again and so on um, over the course of the day. It goes ahead and allows me to split up those climbs within the UI to see each one of those climbs individually. Uh, so as opposed to having the entire elevation graph for your entire day, which can get really long, um, each climb is shown it's actually really darn cool. It's especially cool when you get off course a little bit because you can still see where you are relative to the climb uh, and that's kind of neat. And it shows you grade and how fast you're going and all that kind of stuff. I found it like really fascinating. And I know it, it may not look all that different from a, a typical elevation chart, but if you're doing a really long day's worth of climbing um, and have multiple climbs with that, it's nice to be able to have those split up and you can see at the top climb one of X uh, and to go ahead and just have each one of those marked off as you go kind of a nice little like check the box sort of feature. Next we have a Phoenix 5X Plus only feature uh, and that is pulse ox or pulse oximetry. Uh, and that allows the Phoenix 5X to measure your pulse oximetry or oxygen saturation levels via the wrist itself. Uh, and so the reason why it's Phoenix 5X only is one, because partly battery, two, because of the size, three, because Garmin wants it to be kind of like a, a higher end only feature uh, that's newer. So they want to try it out there and see if it works out and then pull it back down. Works out meaning from like a market standpoint, not from an accuracy standpoint. I'll talk about that in a second. But the way it works is it goes ahead and measures your blood saturation levels using a red LED sensor that is in this watch but not in the other two watches. Uh, and it does that automatically on a preset schedule um, every 15 minutes normally. Um, or if you're hiking, it does that uh, whenever you manually do it. So it won't do it like when you're moving very much. Uh, and so you may want to set an alarm like you may have just heard a second ago, in fact, um, to stop for about 20 or 30 seconds to do that. Uh, and the reason is that if you look at pulse oximetry devices that you typically find in the medical realm, those little clip on things in your finger, um, those are designed to be taken while you're sitting down or stopped or indoors and stuff like that. In fact, the FDA testing for that, the medical certification testing for that is done sitting in a chair indoors in a room where you don't move at all. Um, and so moving that to the wrist, uh, it's a harder place to do that. And so Garmin says you do have to stop for 20, 30 seconds. And that's what I've seen as well. Um, when I'm sleeping and stuff, it does tend to take those readings automatically. Uh, but here I just set, simply set an alarm for every 20 minutes and I went ahead and checked those values as I was coming up here. It then overlays that against your elevation reading so you can see that um, and then track your acclimation history over time. Pretty darn cool stuff. 
Now, from a use case standpoint, pulse ox is primarily used to track that oxygen saturation level. It's very, very common in high altitude hiking. Uh, so, for example, Himalayas, things like that. Any sort of scenario where you're at high elevations and want to track um, that oxygen saturation level. Keep in mind, however, that the readings on this do not necessarily mean that things are going bad or good. Um, you can read all of this on the interwebs if you want to, which then begs the question, is Garmin getting into the medical device realm? And the answer is kind of, sort of, yes, in a way. Um, so the way it works is that Garmin is working with the, with the FDA on what's called a software medical device. And that means that they, alongside of Apple, Fitbit, and Samsung, are working to certify certain software portions of a device. So you have the device and you have a software app that sits atop it. In the case of Garmin, that's a Connect IQ app. So that allows them to separate out the base device, in this case the Phoenix 5X, from being a certified medical device compared to an app um, that is delivering some sort of diagnostic information that's going to give results that are FDA approved. Garmin says that is fully, quote, in within their wheelhouse of things to do. In fact, they're even so confident in the technology, looking at doing uh, the full $50,000 FDA certification test um, for the underlying hardware itself, um, for the Pulse Ox piece, uh, which is a, a rather complicated test. You can actually read about it online if you want to. So it'll be interesting to see how this all kind of moves forward. Now, of course, regardless of whether or not this is certified by the FDA, um, you still need to use some sort of approach to determine whether or not the levels that it's giving you are appropriate for your particular body. Uh, just like you can have a certified medical device, but you need a doctor to interpret those results. Not saying you need a doctor here, but you want to have someone that at least knows what the heck they're doing. So the last item that's probably really important to talk about is price because this thing is not cheap. Um, so this thing is at $699 right now, which is $150 more than the Phoenix 5 series. And I kind of went back to Garmin with a solid like, what the... That's $150 more for adding in music, maps, and contactless payments in a nutshell. Um, you know, obviously there's some features and stuff like that. And that's in a world where prices are generally going down. Like you can get now the Fitbit Versa for 200 bucks um, that has music on it and apps on it, um, 229 with contactless payments on it. I don't know if Garmin gets it. I think they're, they're thinking people are gonna keep on paying more and more money. Uh, and that's, that's kind of, I'm not really sure about that. Obviously it'd be up to you whether or not you think it's worth the additional funds. Uh, but we're talking a $700 watch right now. Uh, and that's a lot of money for, for a watch. Um, I don't know, just me. So with that, um, as far as how well the watch is working for me, it's been actually pretty awesome. So I, I really can't complain from a functionality perspective. Um, all in all, like it's been, it's been pretty good. We'll jump real quick to some of the things that may not have worked out well uh, by time this watch releases, just so I can kind of cover those briefly in one little section. Okay, as I promised at the beginning of this video, I was gonna go ahead and circle back on any bugs, any quirks that I may have seen along the way since shooting it, since I shot this video, the majority of it anyways, three weeks ago. Um, it is now the night before sunset's occurring right now. Uh, the Phoenix 5 Plus series is announced. I'm holding my phone because the mic keeps on resetting and that's just how I have my microphone. So I've shot this now four times and every time it resets. So I'm just gonna hold it and watch it like that. Um, speaking of resetting, so in terms of the watch, it's reset on me precisely once in the middle of an activity. In fact, it was just after shooting that video. It was just as I shot the video itself, uh, it resets just uh, like a few minutes later. It was really weird. Um, and that was the only time it did that. Uh, Garmin's looking into it, they're not quite sure why. Uh, and at the same time it did that, uh, or slightly before it did that, in fact, the Climb Pro data, after I reached the peak of that climb, did some funky stuff, like it just didn't look quite right anymore. Um, so I'd done the climb, I finished the climb, but then the data on the, the Climb Pro screen just didn't look right. It didn't impact any of the recorded data, the recorded data was fine, but that was the one time it wasn't right. Uh, and so that's something that Garmin is also looking into. Um, it's been three weeks, I've been mostly in the Netherlands and Florida, both of which are largely pancake flat, so I haven't really have a way I can retest that. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. On the reset side of things, um, uh, I haven't had any of the resets at all in the last two months on any of the watches. I've got all three watches, and actually I've now six, I think, watches, um, and none of them have reset at all. So it is what it is, um, which is kind of like the general testing sort of thing in that I test my watches a certain way, which is just I use them for um, running and cycling, a little bit of swimming and hiking, uh, and in the settings that I've always used for the last decade. Uh, and I try to like mix up settings. I try to use different GPS settings and mapping and all that kind of stuff. Um, but if you have some little feature that's different than mine, that could cause an issue that I don't see and, and vice versa. So um, there are, I mean, literally probably millions of combinations on these watches. And so I try to do the best I can, but it is sort of what it is. Um, from a GPS accuracy standpoint overall things were very very good I've been using predominantly Galileo um, for my GPS uh, testing just because uh, I wanted to see how well it works since it was new um, and it really really good especially in like harder terrain like the Alps it turned out great I did have one run yesterday where the GPS track was like me it wasn't it wasn't great it wasn't bad it wasn't it was just like Meh. Um, if you looked at it on Strava you would have said like man it looks fine um, but having looked at it 
compared to some other tracks, it wasn't like as perfect as uh, most other tracks I've seen. And in that case, it was actually odd because that was something that wasn't a hard place. It was just a simple neighborhood with very low trees. So not sure what was going on there, but um, otherwise pretty good music. No issues there with both stored music and iHeartRadio, the streaming service. Uh, no problems. Garmin Pay, no problems there um, with contactless payments. They just added in Chase last week, um, Chase Banks in the US. So I was able to add that on there. So that was pretty good. So, okay, so there you go, a full review of the Phoenix 5 Series. I definitely check out my full in-depth review down in the description there, which has a gazillion more things covered in it. Um, in-depth analysis of accuracy and all that kind of stuff is down there. Uh, so you can dive into all those pieces. Uh, it is incredibly long and it would take me like hours to do on this YouTube video. Uh, also, I've got some other videos on the Phoenix 5 Plus Series linked somewhere up there. Uh, I should have a, a UI overview where I walk through all the features on the interface itself. Um, and I should also have uh, kind of some unboxing stuff and, and stuff like that so anyways check all that out thanks for watching if you found this interesting go and watch that subscribe button we got Eurobike coming up in two weeks it is going to be bonkers uh, there's so 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 much stuff coming i've got so many videos queued up um, and so many videos still left to edit uh, so definitely subscribe if you want to hit all that stuff or just simply hit the like button i really appreciate it have a good one